Um, hello, everyone. We're going to get started. Good evening. Uh, tonight's meeting is dedicated to the militant history of the LGBTQ2S struggle, which arose from the fight against police terror, murder, and oppression in the 1960s. This movement was founded by our queer trans siblings who fought in the streets against police raids and terror. This history is tied to the current rebellions of the Black Lives Matter movement. Uh, so my name is Leilani Dowell, and I am a member of the Durham, North Carolina branch of Workers' World Party. And we've had incredible, pro incredible protests and demonstrations in my city in support of Black Lives Matter. Um, Durham is really proud for being one of the uh, first cities to tear, you know, the people to tear down a Confederate statue here in 2017 after the murder of Heather Hayer in Charlottesville. Um, and we've been following that legacy right now. Um, after days of protest in Raleigh um, and the toppling of another statue there, the city took it upon themselves in the past few days to remove statues around the Capitol. Um, and this weekend, in the spirit of pride, there's a rally being organized by the um, by BYP 100, which is Black Youth Project 100, and the House of Cox, which is our local ag house. Uh, so we're really, um, you know, we're continuing uh, the legacy of struggle, and we're really excited and um, happy to be doing that. Um, so I would like to now introduce my co-moderator, Devin Cole. Devin is a non-binary transgender communist organizer, originally from Birmingham, Alabama, now living in Pensacola, Florida, um, which both are, are occupy Muscogee Creek land. Um, they, Devin is the president of STRIVE, also known as Socialist Trans Initiative, a transgender advocacy organization in Pensacola, and they are part of the growing Pensacola, South Alabama branch of Workers' World. Um, Devin, could you talk a little bit about what has been happening in Florida with the recent murders and the terrorist acts against transgender people and the response of the community there? Uh-oh. Ah. Thank you, Lonnie. Uh, technical difficulties, I apologize. Uh, I am so honored to co-moderate this important webinar with you. Uh, before I go any further, I would like to introduce you. Uh, Leilani is a longtime activist and contributing editor of Workers World newspaper. She has participated in fact-finding delegations around the world and ran for US Congress in 2004 on an anti-war platform. Leilani holds a PhD in English. I also want to explain why we have two spirit in the title of this webinar. Uh, according to Indian countries today, when indigenous people on this continent first met the European colonial settlers, Native American societies recognized three to five gender roles, female, male, two-spirit, female, two-spirit, male, and transgender. LGBT Native Americans in 1989 adopted the term two-spirit from the Ojibwe language because of their desire to be identified with their tribe and not grouped with other races. We recognize the inclusion of the two-spirit people in our LGBTQ plus community. So here in Pensacola, uh, we have had small but very effective in terms of where we are, uh, protests, uh, occupations of historic landmarks in downtown Pensacola uh, in support of the Black Lives Matter, okay, in support of the Black Lives Matter uprisings around the country. Uh, the organization I oversee is again called STRIVE, which is Socialist Trans Initiative. We are a transgender advocacy organization. We provide uh, things such as housing, HRT, uh, food, uh, payment for utilities and things like that to transgender people in need. Uh, we are the only organization of our kind for over 200 miles around. And what we wanted to do this Pride Month, because Pride was canceled uh, basically everywhere, is that we wanted to take the revolutionary spirit of the caravans that have been happening all over the world and turn it into uh, a celebration of Pride. So we did a Pride caravan. Excuse me. We did a Pride caravan. Um, and what that consisted of was well over 50 people, between 50 and 65 people. There were 29 cars in total, and we just decked all of our vehicles out in, you know, LGBTQ decor, um, and we drove around downtown Pensacola to, you know, just 
acknowledge that, yes, we can't celebrate Pride this year in person, in a park, or in any kind of street festivities. But in the spirit of Stonewall and in the spirit of Pride, and this is the 50th anniversary of Pride, we wanted to show that we are still visible, we are still out here, uh, we're still powerful. Uh, we are still in solidarity with the Black Lives Matter uprisings all over this world, all over this nation. Um, it was a very successful event, and um, we are very grateful to have been, to have taken the initiative on this. Uh, and we, we hope to see it more in the future. We want to do it again. We'd love to see other people do it. Um, so that is what's happening down here in, in Pensacola. Uh, additionally, all of the leftist organizations down here, communist, socialist, anarchist, uh, have all united to form the Central Gulf Coast People's Council, which is a council of organizations between, uh, between Panama City and Gulfport, Mississippi. And we are all, we're doing multiple people's assemblies uh, around these areas to determine what the needs of the communities are and determine how we can build people's power from that. So it's very unprecedented to see these things uh, happening down here in the, in the very deep south, but we are leading this initiative. Uh, we are very excited and uh, we're going to keep going until, you know, until we win. Awesome. Thanks, Devin. Um, so just this, we this webinar is organized by activists and members of Workers' World Party, which is a national revolutionary organization fighting for socialism. If you like what you hear tonight and you want to check us out, you can go to um, www.workers.org and click on join WWP to sign up. Um, so we're going to go ahead and get started with our first speaker, which is Teresa Gutierrez. Uh, Teresa is a leading member of Workers' World Party and FIRE, which stands for Fight for Immigrants and Refugees Everywhere, um, who now lives in San Antonio, Texas. Teresa has, um, has organized the San Antonio branch of Workers' World Party. Teresa, can you give us a historical perspective of the LGBTQ movement and how it relates to what is happening today with the movement against police terror? I'll do my best. Can you see me? No. Huh? No, we can't see you right now. Okay, is that my fault? Okay, me. I don't know. <laughs> okay, how now? How about there now? There you go. There you go. Okay. Great. Sorry. Buenas tardes, uh, camaradas and family. Uh, good evening, comrades and friends and family. Um, it is difficult to talk about oppression. It is even harder to live it, but we are living, li living in extreme times where oppression surrounds us every second of the day. It is a stench so deep, no one, not even the 1% of society can escape it, and I'll explain that later. It is therefore good to quickly review the movement for LGBTQ liberation and some lessons as we struggle to not only cope with the two pandemics over us, police terror and COVID-19, but to organize so that police brutality ends forever and a socialized healthcare system is established. There was once a time when every gay person was forced to live deep in the shadows, way back in the closet. The idea of marrying someone of your own sex or walking down the street freely was far-fetched, much less the wonderful ideas that our gender non-conforming youth have brought us today. The only reason that changed was because of the struggle. We still have a long way to go. Young queer people are still forced out of their homes by bigoted parents. Transgender people of color are still murdered on the streets but the struggle has brought great changes. One example is the October 1987 March on Washington for lesbian and gay rights and action on AIDS. Half a million people participated. What propelled this demonstration was not only that LGBTQ people were forced to live in constant fear, but that the AIDS epidemic 
that was ravaging parts of Africa was here, particularly targeting gay men and brought thousands of deaths. The founder of our party, Sam Marcy, said that if AIDS had targeted the US Senate, they would have found a cure immediately. What led to a cure was not the CDC, but the movement itself. It was the LGBTQ community who picketed, demonstrated, sat in the streets, occupied government offices, and shamed government officials to get the world's attention. It was the movement, and only the movement, that made the difference. Recently, I read an interview with a pulmonologist who treats mainly COVID patients. She said, I did my training during the AIDS era. I saw how people in the hardest hit communities came together to push for research and clinical trials. This is what is needed today, she concluded, to cure COVID. But along comes motherfucking Derek Chauvin, excuse my language, who viciously and brutally killed our brother, Mr. George Floyd. This murder exposed again the attitude the capitalist system has toward Black people, as well as the role of the police, as well as the role of the police under this system. These KKK goons demonstrated that the police are here only to control and repress. And that is why the call to defund and abolish the police is righteous. They thought they could get away with it, but they were wrong. It was the last straw, just like AIDS was the last straw for our community. Had it not been for police terror, we would be marching in the streets or car caravanning every day to demand COVID relief. But that's okay, because this movement is serious. It is mature. It has learned so much from the past, and it inherently knows that the struggle to end police terror goes hand in hand with ending COVID, no matter what is not being said on the placards. The calls to wear masks at protests say enough. Let's picture the movements against white supremacy and for LGBTQ rights as blocks that together can do a lot, including breaking windows. These blocks build. That is why the recent Supreme Court ruling in favor of LGBTQ rights is very much linked to the Black Rebellion. This reactionary court did not want another rebellion on their hands. The same is true for the Stonewall Rebellion. It did not matter who was on the courts or in the White House. What mattered was who was in the streets, and that was especially black and brown trans and drag queens who led this rebellion. We will always remember Marsha P. Johnson and Sylvia Rivera. They will never die. Their spirit will live forever in the hearts of all revolutionaries. These are the building blocks that progress grows from. In a recent chat here in San Antonio among BLM activists, someone naively posted a picture of a t-shirt in a Christian bookstore with the slogan, take back the rainbow. The person was not sure if it was offensive and wanted to start a conversation about that. And there was some back and forth. But lo and behold, the moderator, a young black woman, took down the post and apologized fiercely for allowing this microaggression to take place in what should have been safe space. I almost wept with joy that they instantly understood how offensive it was, but that she also had the guts to take it down. Some things are just not up for debate, she understood. Many recognize that it is critical for the Black Liberation Movement and the LGBTQ movement to join hands. First, because the LGBTQ community is itself a beautiful rainbow, but mostly because together we can do so much. Huey P. Newton in 1970, a co-founder of the Black Panther Party, spoke on gay and women's rights and urged revolutionary class solidarity. He wrote, and I quote, during the past few years, these movements have developed seeking liberation. There has been uncertainty about how to relate to these women and gay movements. Whatever your personal opinions and your insecurities about homosexuality, 
we should unite with them in a revolutionary fashion, end quote. Now this sounds so obvious today, but in 1970, it was groundbreaking. Comrades, I cannot say enough how important our solidarity is with the Black struggle. What is the role of our party in the midst of these pandemics? What is the role of our queer comrades or our brown or white comrades? It is to work to build unity, to show solidarity, especially when contradictions arise. Four years ago, when a Muslim brother carried out a massacre at the Pulse Gay Bar, our party and most of the LGBTQ movement understood not to let this atrocity be used to whip up any further anti-Muslim repression. We had had enough of that vilification since September the 11th. I remember the queer comrades crying together at news of the massacre because a gay bar, after all, is a historic place of refuge and had been violated. But these were tears used to build a river of resistance because we knew that it was capitalism and vicious homophobia, including internalized homophobia that led to the Pulse Massacre. That is what I mean, our building blocks of struggle that can be thrown at our enemies can also build a wall of solidarity and compassion. Today, we must show our utmost unconditional solidarity with the Black struggle. We live in such a stench of a capitalist society that it counts on rotten divisions to stay afloat. We refuse to go there. Our unity will wipe out this stench. We must take care of our own Black comrades who, like all the Black masses, live with incredible trauma every damn day. We do not lecture to or take over the movement, but we do want to meet and work with all those who want to work with us to smash capitalism once and for all. Fortunately, the times are changing, not because of wishful thinking, but because of material conditions. We can smell the stench of a dying capitalist system, a monster that is rotten to the core, but it can go no further as it is mired in its own contradictions. This stench is so strong that even the 1% smell it. Why else would they be taking down their odious statues or throwing millions of dollars to the movement? But guess what, Bezo, you cannot buy your way out of this morass. Because no amount of cooptation, no amount of repression, no stupid president or the other doddering fool can get capitalism out of its crisis. To many in our class, we understand that there's no solution but revolution. The earth is dying, liberalism cannot save it, no more band-aids will do, no more piece of the pie, no more seats at the table. We want a whole new eco-friendly table. Workers know the capitalists did not prepare for this pandemic and they will not prepare for another one because money is, comes before safety. That is why we know finally that there will be a revolution in this country. And afterwards, we queer people will honor George Floyd, name streets and gay centers after him and all the victims of police and ICE terror because their deaths sparked fundamental change, even for queer people. That is why it is right to rebel. Thank you. Thank you so much, Teresa. It is right to rebel. Uh, we are so glad that you moved to Texas and we appreciate so much your analysis of these two great movements. Now, we will have a question and answer session later in this webinar. Uh, please put your questions into the Q&A section at the bottom of your screen rather than in the chat. Uh, hopefully we can get to most of them. Now I would like to introduce our next speaker, uh, Sofia Sepulveda. Sofia is a first-generation Mexican-American trans-Latina healthcare organizer for the Texas Organizing Project. She is the co-lead organizer for the Medicare for All March in San Antonio and the Million Women's March in Washington. She also co-founded TransPower San Antonio. Sophia, can you share your perspective as a trans Latina woman about the intersection of your movement for healthcare and the Black Lives Matter rebellion happening now in the streets? 
Yes, first, thank you, Devin, so much for inviting me to this amazing panel. As a Latina, I'm very hopeful about the direction that we are going right now and how amazing it is that we have this massive awakening led mostly by young people of color who are tired of seeing police violence on Black lives. It is important to add that Black Lives Matter all the time, not just your police violence. I believe there is an intersection in the fight for, in the fight for healthcare liberation and the Black Lives Matter movement. We know that Black and Brown folks have the highest risks, risks of the diabetes, cancer, and heart diseases. We also know that Black and Brown folks have the least access to healthcare than any other group in this country. We have a high rate of maternal mortality rate, higher than any other developed country in most of these women who have died are women of color. Um, also, the idea of continuing to tie healthcare with employment is the range. We have seen almost 44 million people applying for unemployment, which inherently means that they will not have access to healthcare services. With COVID-19, we have seen black and brown communities experiencing the brunt of the pandemic. We have also seen a number of deaths in said populations with Native Americans and Black folks experiencing the highest death per capita, followed by the Latino community. We also know many folks, in particular people of color, who are, are unable to afford healthcare and sometimes wait far too long before they can see a doctor, making their maladies worse. As a trans woman, I can also say that our Black trans sisters and brothers have been assaulted kill, but we are not talking enough about this. Last year, the majority of trans women killed were Black. Two days after the, the George Floyd assassination, a trans man, Tony McDade, was murdered by the Tallahassee police in his house for no reason at all. His name was pretty much not mentioned in those marches, right? Two weeks later, Dominic Felt and Rhea Milton, two Black trans women were murdered. Only one C march to the next one. Now I know that you were part of that. So thank you very much, Devon, for doing that. And um, to denounce these killings and, and to speak their names. As I watch this documentary called From Selma to Stonewall, um, which I definitely recommend, uh, Darnell Moore, a writer and queer activist, said something that ran very true. All Black lives matter not just cis black lives, but queer lives and trans, black, uh, trans lives as well. Camilla Factory, a local Black Lives Matter organizer, screamed that out two Saturdays ago during a queer for Black Lives Matter rally. And I say that we are fighting for true liberation. We must mean liberation for all and liberation of all that keeps us oppressed, including access to healthcare. When we speak about abolition, we should have in mind that it's not only abolishing ICE, prisons, or abolishing the police. We must also say abolish private insurance because it is the cause of heartaches for many people suffering from chronic conditions because they cannot afford to go see a doctor or get medication. And we should know that living or dying should not be determined by the size of your wallet, the color of your skin, or the country where you came from. And by no means, I'm saying that single payer is the answer to the um, to end the way in which the healthcare system is run today, we have a lot of work to do after. The medical system in the United States is rooted in racism. Racism is very much still taught in medical schools. In 2013, the, Ameri the American Medical Association conducted a study where it shows racism was very prevalent, still in the ways that we treat our patients, particularly people of color. Doctors still believe that black and brown folks have a higher tolerance to pain than white folks. Uh, I can provide you the study to the chat, uh, on the chat so you can actually see it. And um, also in 2016, um, there was a survey of 20, 222 white medical students and residents published in the Proceedings of the National Academy of Science. And it showed that half of them endorsed at least one myth about physiological differences between black people and white people, including that black people have um, nerve endings are less sensitive than white people. When asked to imagine how much pain white or black patients experience in hypoth hypothetical situations, the medical students and residents insisted that black people feel less pain. This has to change. 
This has to change. As a trans woman, I can also say that trans lives are in peril, in particular, the lives of black and brown trans folks. Because our communities tend to be more religious, we see a high number of displaced LGBTQ folks. Addiction is also rampant in our communities as well as HIV cases and STDs. Many times we are unable to access or afford the treatment we need, whether it's hormone replacement therapy or HIV STD medication. We know from studies that not having access to hormone replacement therapy is a cause of high case, cases of depression and suicide in our community because of homophobia, transphobia, and miseducation in the healthcare system. Many times we don't go back to our doctors because we are constantly misgender or dead name. So we miss treatments that could be life-saving, such as HIV medication and treatment. So we mask as this. Gay liberation started with Marsha P. Johnson, a black trans woman, and Sylvia Rivera, a Latina trans woman. So we must remember that when we are making demands regarding Black Lives Matter, the funding and abolishing the police and protect our people, we must never forget that single payer healthcare and an overhaul of the medical textbooks, including updating the medical text on Black lives, Latino lives, and queer lives, and trans lives should be part of those demands. Thank you so much, Sophia. Um, we really wanna thank you for not only your talk, but your work in San Antonio, which is really um, very inspirational to all of us. Um, so our next speaker needs a little introduction. Unfortunately, uh, we cannot have him live on the program because Mumia Abu-Jamal has been a political prisoner held in the dungeons of Pennsylvania since 1981. Uh, Mumia was the Minister of Information for the Philadelphia Black Panther Party when he was 15 years old. He became a journalist and radio personality who always gave voice to the voiceless. Um, he was imprisoned unfairly and held captive by the police gang called the Fraternal Order of Police um, and um, has sent, you know, um, been vocal, uh, very vocal in his time in prison and has spoken out in support of the Black trans community. And so we're going to listen to his podcast right now. rightist forces in this emerging fascist movement in America. What does this mean? Why now? I believe it comes now for a specific strategic purpose, where trans women stand on the periphery of the gay rights movement, not its nucleus. This means they are isolated and as such targeted by rightist forces to isolate them further. We must not forget that they are, after all, black folks in a land and at an era where and when black life remains cheap. Now add black, gay, and transgender. See where the analysis goes? And if it's black trans women today, it'll be black straight women tomorrow and black children soon thereafter. That's the nature of the fascist beast. Attack those who seem weak, isolate them, and destroy them. Since Charlottesville, we've seen the emergence of rightist, racist forces that are committed to destroying black life and to proving that black lives don't matter. The lives of black people are the literal foundation, not just of America, but all of us. We need to build a radical movement that protects all of us, for all of us, that consigns such racist violence to the trash heaps of history. From imprisonment, this is Mumia Abu Jamal. These commentaries are recorded by Noel Hanrahan of Prison Radio. Thank you, Comrade Mamiya. We will continue to struggle for your freedom and for the release of all political prisoners. We want to credit Prison Radio for all of their work in broadcasting the voices of prisoners and for continuing to um, broadcast the, work, uh, the words of Mamiya over these many years. So in the midst of the explosion of protests and rebellions for Black Lives Matter, the U.S. Supreme Court ruled on June 15th 
that LGBTQ workers could no longer be discriminated against on the job. This is a tremendous victory for our movements. At the same time, the Supreme Court ruled against black and brown families of victims for police murder, of, excuse me, um, of victims of police murder and terror. Our next speaker is Minnie Bruce Pratt. Uh, she leads, needs little introduction and has a long history in the struggle for LGBTQ rights as well as the fight against racism. Minnie Bruce is a managing editor of Workers World newspaper who came out as a lesbian in North, here in North Carolina in 1975. She is a well-known poet and her, late, her last book of poetry was inspired by the Communist Manifesto. Um, that book is called Inside the Money Machine. Minnie Bruce, could you talk about the significance of the recent Supreme Court decision, what it means to the LGBTQ movement and its relationship to the Black Lives Matter movement? Hey, Leilani, and hey, everybody. Thank you so much. Happy Pride with Justice Day to everybody, and, and much appreciation and, and thanks for the important news and insights given by the other panelists and the moderators tonight. How fortunate we all are to be in the struggle together at this particular June Pride Month, this month of historic uprising and outcry against racism with young people of color and young queer people in the lead, so much so that many Pride actions have also become Black Lives Matter protests and marches as, as happened here where I am in Syracuse, New York, which is uh, Onondaga land that has never been ceded. Now, the Supreme Court decisions. This has been a historic month in terms of U.S. Supreme Court decisions. Not unrelatedly, there was this unprecedented victory for the LGBTQ2S uh, community when on June 15th, the court interpreted Title VII of the 1964 Civil Rights Act and made it illegal for employers to discriminate against a person because of sexual orientation and transgender status. This was an unprecedented ruling. Previously, this federal law only protected a person's job rights against discrimination because of a person's sex, and that was defined as traditional male, female gender definitions. The movement struggled for a long time to try and get this right. It was not able to be won by legislation. The Supreme Court decision, therefore, is groundbreaking and history making. And another big win came uh, the same week for the immigrant rights community on June 18th. Uh, when the Supreme Court sided with DACA recipients, in other words, the dreamers, the young people who are immigrant children and now young adults brought to the U.S. by parents who had no legal standing here. That a Supreme Court ruling said that the dreamers could stay here in their home in the U.S. for now. Still, a great victory, a great victory. So, why did a court with an acknowledged 5-4 deeply conservative majority give these progressive decisions? Because there is an outright intransigent uprising and outcry against racism going on in the streets, highways, and byways of U.S. metropolitan cities, small cities, high schools and universities, stock car racing tracks, and even suburban neighborhoods. This rebellion is led by young people of color, young queer and trans people, young immigrant people who have generated a mass movement that is changing the social and political landscape of the U.S. Witness the monuments of white supremacy being laid low and the landscape is changing. The role of the U.S. Supreme Court, to which judges receive a lifetime appointment, is to make rulings that, over time, help the capitalist ruling class maintain a grip on power. So, when mass movements say enough is enough and rise up in the streets threatening profound change, the court can be forced into progressive rulings to try to keep a lid on revolution. But the court always also zealously 
rules in ways that will buttress up the capitalist state in some way. And the Supreme Court did this on the very same day they granted the LGBTQ2S ruling. On that day, they affirmed that cops, whose main role is to protect capitalist property, continue to have what is called qualified immunity. All this means is it's the cops are protected from being prosecuted for shooting people down in the street for killing people. Qualified immunity. Now, these glorious uprising, this glorious uprising and then the smaller uprising locally that are going on now in June have very deep roots in Black and Latinx and other struggles against national oppression and also very deep roots in the revolutionary origins of LGBTQ2S pride in the US. As has been said by other people, the very first uprisings that sparked the 20th century LGBTQ movement, those uprisings were led by trans and queer people of color, not just Stonewall, but the Compton's Cafeteria Rebellion in San Francisco in 1966, the Black Cat Cafe Rebellion in Los Angeles in 1967, and of course the Stonewall Uprising, bar, uh, the Stonewall Bar Uprising in New York City in 1969. We've already heard the names called, of Marsha P. Johnson, Marsha P. Pay It No Mind Johnson, and Sylvia Rivera. These two trans women of color were combatants and leaders in the fighting at Stonewall, and so were many, many more queer trans people of color who fought in that battle and whose names are unknown to history yet, but are held close in our hearts. All of these earlier uprisings were rebellions against the criminalization of LGBTQ2S sexuality. In the 1960s, very specifically, you could still be prosecuted as a felon in every U.S. state, every U.S. state, if you were gay or lesbian or had any kind of sex that fell under the vicious quote, sodomy statutes, the crime against na nature statutes, they were called. And there were also many laws on the books criminalizing so-called cross-dressing or acts of gender nonconformity. You could be prosecuted or you could suffer other social penalties, as I did. I lost custody, custody of my children in North Carolina, specifically because I was violating the sodomy uh, statutes, the crime against nature laws. Those early uprisings were also fight backs against police raids on queer bars and social gatherings, and those raids were justified by the sodomy statutes and the gender policing laws. The raids in which there was unending daily, weekly cop violence, police humiliations through public stripping, arrests, beatings, torture, rape in the cells, and publication of the arrests that often led to queer suicides. The uprisings were emphatically rebellions against the brutal racism of cops, not just at the bars, but also night and day against the overwhelmingly poor, often very, very young trans and queer people of color who survived by doing sex work on the streets. Sylvia Rivera survived in this way from the age of nine on the streets of New York City. These early rebellions gathered force and power from intertwining with other struggles going on in the 1960s. The fight against racism and national oppression waged by the black civil rights and black nationalist movements. The indigenous and Latinx struggles, the anti-war and women's liberation currents. As, as was said earlier, Black Panther Party co-founder Huey Newton issued that statement of solidarity with gay liberation and women's liberation in 1970. Sylvia Rivera was a member of the Young Lords who fought for self-determination for Puerto Rican, Latinx, and colonized people. In 1970, an organization founded by Marcia and Sylvia, Street Transvestite Action Revolutionaries, issued the following demands. They are revolutionary demands. They're at the heart of the uprisings that are going on now, today. 
their demands included an end to homophobia, an end to racism, an end to incarceration, an end to police harassment and job discrimination. One sentence read, all oppressed people should have free education, health care, clothing, food, transportation, and housing. And the manifesto ended. We want a revolutionary people's government where transvestites, street people, women, homosexuals, Puerto Ricans, indigenous, and all oppressed people are free and not fucked over by this government who treat us like the scum of the earth and kills us off like flies one by one and throws us into jail to rot. This government who spends millions of dollars to go to the moon and lets the poor people starve to death. As the first pride marches began in New York City in 1970, Workers' World Party's mass organization, YOF, Youth Against War and Fascism, carried a banner into the streets with the slogan, Stonewall means fight back. And we still fight under that banner. Then a few years later, Workers' World Party comrade Leslie Feinberg developed the first Marxist analysis of trans oppression, linking the liberation of all gender oppressed people, including women and trans people, to socialist victory over capitalism. These are the revolutionary fight back currents that have streamed down from the 1970s through the 1990s into this Pride Fight Back Month, and these are some of the roots of this historic new rebellion against racism and national oppression and for a liberation that includes gay, lesbian, bi, trans, and gender non-conforming people and women, people living with disabilities, workers, and poor people. And it is this mass uprising that is, that is forcing unprecedented concessions from the ruling class, like the Supreme Court rulings. They are forcing those out of a capitalist ruling class established on colonization and white supremacy. This is a mass uprising that gives us the promise a better world is in birth. Thanks. Thank you so much, Minnie Bruce. Uh, thank you to all of our speakers tonight. Uh, I hope that those of you attending the webinar have put questions into the Q&A at the bottom of your screen. Now, before we move to the question and answer discussion, I would like to let everyone know that you can subscribe to Workers World newspaper and have it delivered directly to your inbox by going to workers.org. Hopefully, we will be starting up our print edition soon, which we canceled for health and safety reasons during this COVID-19 pandemic. But you can subscribe to the virtual one in the meantime. All right. Now, if all of our panelists can go ahead and turn on their video, we can begin our discussion. So now for the first question, um, let's see. how can the LGBTQ community show solidarity with the Black Lives Matter movement? Uh, and can you give some concrete examples from your area? Hi. Sophia, so I think um, the way that it's happening right now, I, with, uh, with the uh, rally that we're going to have on Sunday, this is the second rally that um, the LGBT community has put together to support the Black Lives Matter movement, right? And not only to support the Black Lives Matter movement, but to um, prop up and to give um, a platform to the lives of the black trans folks who have been killed um, throughout the years, right? So I think there is a lot of um, interse intersectionality within the movements of the Black Lives Movement, it's kind of like what Mini and Teresa said, um, when it comes to um, the way that um, the movement began, right? And uh, and again, I go back to the, the, the Selma to Stonewall, right? It, it turns out that a lot of civil rights activists and civil rights movement leaders became um, 
LGBTQ leaders went after the civil rights movement or civil rights act what was signed into law. So we have those examples that we can definitely follow uh, the steps in order to achieve a more, not just congruent, but a more unifying movement. I, w I would add one short thing. Um, <clears throat> I think that the LGBTQ community has historically, while of course there's the sector like in any movement that's very tied to the Democratic Party and you know it makes mistakes on racism and stuff like that. Overall, I think the LGBT community has been one of the most revolutionary movements in the country. And like you can go back, like Shelly and I can go back to all our buttons that we've collected over the years and you will see queers against US intervention in Central America, queers against apartheid, you know, et cetera. And I, I think, you know, oppression does that to you. It just you're just naturally uh, in an affinity with, with other oppressions. So I just I just think that, you know, that it's in our blood, so to speak. And I think um Sophia and San Antonio, and I'm sure in other cities are doing wonderful jobs, you know, to, to link the two struggles and it's just a natural alliance, I think, there. Um, that's a nice segue. Hold on one second. Uh, okay, that's a nice segue to our next question, which is, um, you know, there's, there's this growing mass movement to defund um, and abolish the police in the prisons. And so um, how can the, um, or how does this movement relate and how can we um, relate this movement to the LGBT struggle and its oppression as well? Like, okay, I'm sorry. I feel like I'm taking a lot of air, a lot of space, but um, when, it comes to, when it comes to abolishing prisons and abolishing jails and abolishing the police is super important, particularly on the, on the trans community, right? Like we know that the trans community has been very much oppressed and, and put to the side and we have been forced to work the streets in which we are punished then because we have to survive, right? So we are taken to jail and then in jail we are abused, right? So we, when we speak about the fund and the police the fund and, and abolishing prisons, we need to think, uh, to keep in mind that it, it also, it's not just a struggle of the black community uh, as a cisgender and uh, uh, folks, right? But it's a struggle within the trans community because we are constantly, constantly harassed and abused by the authorities because unfortunately society has put us, has places that I, I, I hope that with the Supreme Court ruling regarding protections uh, to LGBTQ folks in places of work, that will change a little bit, but I really doubt it, right? particularly on red states where it's very much contentious, right? Like the, the last two legislative sessions in Texas, we had to fight against the bathroom bills who have been appearing in a lot of red states across the country in order to deny us access to any public space, right? So I'm hoping that this moves the needle a, a little bit, but it's not over yet. We need to make sure that, again, liberation is not just within one community, liberation is all of us together as a whole. And and I would add, um, just to follow up on your, on, on your thoughts, Sophia, around what happens around the targeting of trans women, um, because so many trans people are still doing sex work as a mode of survival, um, the ordinances that come through in the cities around uh, street life, right? Uh, the, the, we've seen this in the various big cities where the, they've instituted various ordinances for quality of life, right? But that means things like panhandling or things like so-called loitering that the homeless people are targeted, but also trans people who are need to be on the streets for for you know, reasons of survival. Also, and then of course, if they are arrested, what happens in the in the cells and in the jail? It's a whole other level of danger. So, I mean, certainly one of the things that could happen in in our communities that are also uh, LGBT 
uh, 2S community, Q2S communities that are already working on incarceration is to pay attention to those kind, that kind of legislation in the cities that doesn't seem immediately linked to jail cells or incarceration, but it's a pathway by which trans people then do get arrested and locked up and then suffer, you know, disproportionately. And the other thing is to pay attention to cases of self-defense in the trans community. For instance, when C.C. McDonald in Minneapolis fought back against a white supremacist who was attacking her friends and herself, she was the one who went to jail. And of course, we know, you know, that pattern. Um, I do want to mention that there's a slideshow at lesliefeinberg.net that's a slideshow of the international campaign to free CC and argue for the right of self-defense. So it's a tool. It could be a tool, like a house party tool or something. People could show it and, and talk about, uh, you know, self-defense or talk about ways to support the trans community. That's it. Thank you both. Um, so the next question is, uh, with COVID-19 infection still a danger, many pride marches have gone virtual. Uh, however, there are some more radical sectors of the LGBTQ2 plus movement that are holding rallies and actions. Could you talk about what is going on in your area and the significance of all of this? I think Sophia covered it for San Antonio, for sure. Well, um, yeah, Pride here in San Antonio is pretty much canceled, right? Like, um, we actually were uh, thinking of getting away from Pride in San Antonio and actually do like a people's Pride, right? Especially because we've seen Pride being co-opted by corporations who do not uphold the lives of LGBTQ folks, right? So um, it, to me, uh, having March alongside uh, Berkshire Hathaway, which is owned by one of the biggest, richest man and, and, and the world, right? And that denied housing to LGBTQ folks during a Pride March is very conflicting, right? So we were thinking of, um, if, if we were going to participate in Pride, uh, this year we were gonna do a, a protest on capitalists uh, and 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 their co-option of the LGBTQ movement. We also were thinking of of doing a um, people like again a people's pride, right? Unfortunately, because this because of COVID nineteen is not we're not gonna be able to sh to do that. We are definitely uniting with the Black Lives Matter movement in in, in San Antonio to uplift the voices of not only Black folks but trans Black. Uh, black folks who have been again murder or or um, yeah brutalized by our communities uh, two two th two years ago two three years ago Kenny McFadden a black trans woman here in San Antonio was killed by a white man right and um, because there was some uh, mishandling on the on the court the guy was able to get off with um, um, technicality and the mayor refused to call it out. Right, so we need to start holding also our, our, our elected officials to account, and it, it, it really upsets me when I see uh, the LGBTQ folks, kind of like Teresa, Teresa says, right, like they're still very entrenched with the Democratic uh, Party, not just the Black community, but the, the LGBTQ community, that they invite him to speak at our events, and, and, and it's maddening because he doesn't really stand for our, our community. They think that painting a rainbow on a cross streets will immediately get rid of homelessness on the, on, on the LGBT community. It will uh, get rid of uh, discrimination on the LGBT community. They refuse to call, uh, call out doctors who are still calling us by our dead names or who are still uh, referring us as male or female. As a court, uh, um, you know, so it, I, I think that we need to start putting more pressure and, and uh, 
having better solidarity with um, with the Black Lives Matter movement in order to uplift our messages. Yeah, I want to mention about um, New York, although I don't live there anymore, but a few years ago, uh, I remember <clears throat> some of the young, the Workers' World Party has a very close alliance with the People's Power Assembly in New York City. And it's a, a really wonderful uh, uh, organization that fights against uh, police terror. And we heard that the PPA and others were saying not to go to Pride. And, and Shelly and I, like, stuck in the mud, old people, we were like, we want to go to Pride, you know? And the reason why is because the, the movement to take the Pride away from the corporations had gotten so strong that they were, that we were able to have a people's Pride. And it, it, it's another example of how the new generation, the younger people are taking things so much further, you know, that, that they now can have a pride that's not led by Coca-Cola or the military or the cops, but it's, a, you know, a real people's rainbow and, and, and anti-capitalist, anti-racist, et cetera. And so I think that's great, you know, like the relation of forces has changed, you know, where the people, are taking back pride. The same thing happened with Puerto Rican pride march in New York City. The, the movement took it back from the corporations. And I mean, it's still a struggle, but it just shows you the progress that we've made. You know, like it's so exciting, you know, that, that this is happening. And and I should add here, because I'm looking at some, some things that are in the chat. Um, the, New York City's Reclaim Pride is coming up this weekend and Workers' World Party and People's Power Assemblies will be marching. So if you're in that area, you should watch for them and join in. And there are also uh, joint marches in other places, I think in Los Angeles and maybe in San Francisco. And I don't know, like I said, the, the Pride here in Syracuse was a combined and not in, and not informally com combined but a deliberately organizationally uh coalitionally formed uh between the pride Com committee in Syracuse and the Black Lives Matter Syracuse and also mm -hmm. Black Lives Matter Youth uh Syracuse so i i think this may be happening in in many places and it's it's tremendously exciting because for quite a long time in Syracuse there would be Juneteenth and there would be Pride and sometimes they were on the same day and it was just not not the way the struggle advances and now we've come to this new place and it's thrilling really and I hope it's happening you know in smaller places than LA and, and New York City. Thanks, y'all. Um, I want to actually take a minute to, um, there's a couple of comments in the question and answer box that I'm not sure whether people can see that I thought it might be interesting to, or important to mention um, from a couple of our comrades in different branches. So comrade Monica in New York said, um, I think it should be mentioned that Sylvia Rivera played a historic and leading role with the founding of the Rainbow Flags from Mumia Coalition. Uh, which was instrumental in bringing together 6,000 people to Madison Square Garden to demand a new trial for Mumia 20 years ago. Um, Mumia also denounced the brutal murder of Matthew Shepard in Wyoming during the 1980s. Um, and then Comrade Diane in Atlanta mentioned, um, she said, I agree that the Supreme Court ruling is a major advance, but many workers live in right to work states, including right here, um, and people can be fired at will. So there remains a cover for bosses. So what I think is needed is genuine worker power that eliminates the racist, sexist, um, you know, anti-LGBTQ ruling class. So just wanted to throw those comments into the hopper. Um, and I thought um, for our next question, we could um, take a more international lens. Um, I've been on a delegation with several of the people on this call. Um, and we have seen what the country is doing to guarantee LGBTQ rights there. And I was wondering if uh, y'all could comment on that. If we could comment on what now? I'm sorry. On LGBTQ rights in Cuba, I'm sorry. Oh, yes. <laughs> Oops. Well, well, I'll say a little bit, but then there, uh, there are lots of other people on the call who could 
comment too. So I'll just say just a bit. Um, so one of the things that I think is significant about LGBTQ, LGBTQ S rights in Cuba is that a foundation was started indirectly uh, in the early days of the revolution by establishing the Federation of Cuban Women. And that, and that group worked for a long time on issues of liberation of women. Then as, um, as the revolution deepened, then other, you know, other advances were made around sexuality issues um, in uh, the 1970s, I think sex education became something that was happening in all the public schools, in all the Cuban schools. Um, they actually had equal pay salaries for women in 1959. Um, so you can see the social transformation started early. In 1988, a, 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 an organization called Cinesex, which is an abbreviation, was founded by uh, Raul Castro's daughter, Marielle. Um, and it concentrated on national programs around sexuality, and that included LGBT issues, sexuality and gender. And the, so those programs could raise, range from anything like drag shows in very small towns that would promote AIDS uh, education um, to the community, uh, to uh, the arts uh, organizations in Cuba sponsoring and funding um, movies that would have would be themed around lesbian or gay issues so all of that's been going on for a while um in 2007 i think they started the international day for uh international day against uh homophobia and transphobia so they're in the 7th, 14th, 13th year of that and that then got expanded to a whole month a whole month of organized programming all through Cuba that was meant to to oppose homophobia and transphobia and educate in a mass way all the people of Cuba. Um, and then there are other things like they have a completely wonderfully functioning uh, public health system, which I experienced when I was in Cuba and some of the other folks here have, on the call have also. And um, Part of the public health system is, uh, in addition to the fact that um, termination of pregnancy or abortion is free and available to anybody, no matter what their uh, gender expression, um, also um, gender uh, affirmation surgery is part of the, of the national health plan as well. Um, there's a lot more to be said, but you can see the Cuba with its ability to take care of people, the people, their people, the people of their own co country, all of the people of Cuba, you can see um, they're far ahead of where we're at here. Thank you. Um, can Leilani, can you hear me? Yes, I can. Okay. All right. My video has just gone out. Um, all right. Well, thank you. And I do have one last question for everybody. Uh, I just wanted to ask, uh, what advice would each of you say you have for keeping up the revolutionary energy over decades and lifetimes? I will start with that. And I also saw a question about uh, the elections. And I think that we tend to skirt that question a lot. Sometimes, I don't know, but uh, Sophia could write a book about elections, uh, I think. Um, but <clears throat> I, I think um, I was very, very hell bent on and worried about Trump getting reelected. I don't have that fear anymore because I don't see much difference between 
Trump and Biden. Now, Biden is not, we, we, our party has always said that the Democrats and the Republicans are the same. They're the party of the ruling class or the party of the bosses. The Republicans want to take off two of your legs. The Democrats will say, no, no, just cut off one leg of the working class. That's the main difference, right? Uh, but of course, Trump is a whole new ball game. Uh, he's a neo-fascist. He's opened up, you know, white supremacy. He campaigned on an anti-Mexican, anti-migrant campaign and opened up, uh, uh, opened up the white supremacist attitudes that we see today. And we don't think that we, that might happen under Biden. But I don't think it's true anymore. And it, it goes back to the rebellion, how much we owe the masses who are rebelling right now against police violence, police terror. Uh, and it's kind of pushed aside the social Democrats. And we have to take a stand that the Democratic Party is as dangerous as the Republican Party. But the Republican Party right now is really, really reactionary and would like to see fascism, would like to see neo-fascism, uh, doesn't do anything when healthcare officials who are talking against opening uh, the states, when the right wing white supremacists go with guns to the houses of these health officials, where many of them are actually forced to, to quit. You know, uh, uh, when you live in a country where somebody like Fauci gets death threats for saying some scientific objective things about the virus, you know you live in a poisonous society. And the only solution to the Bidens of the world and the that the Democratic Party would select Biden is an offense to every single person in this country. Uh, and I know in my talk that I called him a, um, I don't know, I made fun of his age. I called him a doddering fool. And I thought that might be offensive, but I'm old and I'm a doddering fool. So I thought it was okay. Um, but for the Democratic Party to choose Biden after after the momentum that was going on in this country for Bernie Sanders, it, you know, it's a crime. Now, some of us did not get on the Bernie Sanders bandwagon because, you know, we didn't think it would go all the way. And it wouldn't go all the way because Sanders did not know how to take it all the way. And he always caves in one way or the other. But the rebellion shows who makes a difference? And so we can only hope to keep this rebellion going one way or the other. That's really the solution to Joe Biden and, and, and Trump. And I do believe that the ruling class, that the Bezos and, and the Amazon people and the, the Zuckerbergs of the, of the society or, or of the ruling class are themselves worried about Trump that he's gonna make a big mistake, that he's gonna kill off too many workers with the virus, and they're not gonna have anybody to deliver their, you know, their products, et cetera. And so the ruling class themselves may not want uh, um, Trump, but the only solution to go forward is to have the faith that, that the capitalist system is at its death throes. It cannot go any further. It can't go uh, to World War III without de decimating the planet. And so we have to be optimistic that it's the mass struggle. It, you know, people for the first time are talking about defunding the police, abolishing the police. 20 years ago, that wouldn't have happened. And, you know, so we've got to keep this momentum up and people know that you need socialized health care and you need a centralized government to deal with COVID. You cannot have one bureaucratic entity over here and one over there. You need a government like Cuba. COVID has not decimated Cuba because they have a socialized uh, health care system, and they have a government that defends the people and not the corporations. That's what we need in the United States. And what keeps old timers like us going year after year after year after year, you know, we, we went through the 60s and 70s rebellion, and here it is, you know, 2020, 
is because we know that capitalism is going to end because people cannot take it. We want our liberation. Just like queers want our liberation, workers will struggle for their emancipation. And we should take advantage of this moment to talk more about so socialism and workers' assemblies and people's power because they've been exposed that they do not care about us. Thank you. Going back to what you say, Teresa, about Biden, <laughs> he did say, uh, don't shoot black folks in the chest, shoot them in the leg oh, instead. Yeah. Right? So, um, yeah, he's no better than um, than, than Trump, in, in my view, either. And, um, and yeah, I could write a book about politics <laughs> in, in the United States. I've been uh, organizing around um, uh, political candidates since uh, Bill Clinton was in office. Actually, I started knocking on doors for Luis Donaldo Colosio, which was a, a candidate for president in Mexico in 1996. So that's how far back I've gone. And what keeps me energized is um, the hope, the hope that uh, we're moving to the right direction, right? Like, um, there, I, I feel like every time that I see any type of injustice, it just gives me the, the fire to continue fighting, right? And organizing, not just fighting, but organizing, talking to our communities, which is extremely difficult right now during COVID-19, right? I, we don't have the freedom to go and knock on a door and talk about issues instead of talking to candidates. But I found that talking to people about issues is more engaging than just say, hey, can you can I count on you to vote? Right? People are eager to talk about their problems. People are eager to change, and people don't want to vote because they feel like neither Democrats or Republicans have served them in the last forty years. And they told me in my face, "Why do I? Why should I vote for a, Demo a Democrat? They my life hasn't changed, and I voted for them the last ten years." So um, that's all. That's all I have to say. <laughs> You're muted, Mimi. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Sophia. I would say the, my answer to that question, it's along your line, Sophia, but short in this way. Stay in touch with your righteous anger. That definitely is like the furnace that gives me the energy to keep going. Thank you, Yana. Um, well, that brings us to uh, close to the end of tonight's webinar. Um, someone asked how many attended this terrific webinar. We had um, just about 100 folks at, at some point attending. So we're really excited to have reached that many people, um, hopefully, you know, throughout the US and hopefully around the world. <laughs> um, we hope that you, again, we hope you enjoyed tonight's webinar. Workers' World Party needs to su your support to continue the revolutionary struggle in this country. We are um, in the streets when we can every day. Uh, we are doing jail support, helping with mutual aid programs, and showing solidarity. We are also a totally volunteer organization, and we depend upon donations from people like you for our survival. Um, and as I'm sure you are all aware, everything under capitalism takes money. So any amount that you can donate will help. We will put it all into continuing the struggle to bring down this rotten, racist, and oppressive system. So you can donate uh, three different ways. Uh, you can either donate at Venmo, um, and the, you would uh, donate to at Workers World, or I'm sorry, at Workers World, um, at our website, which is workers.org donate, or um, at patreon.com, and you would, um, I suppose, search for WWP. Um, and just as a reminder, all donations to patreon.com will go directly to providing free subscriptions of Workers World newspaper to prisoners all over the country. Uh, we consider this an important part of our solidarity with people behind the bars and the walls of US prisons, jails, and detention centers. Our newly formed Prisoner Solidarity Committee says it, says it loudly and clearly, free them all. Um, Devin, you want to close this up? Yeah. All power to the people. 
Yes. yes. All power to the people. <laughs> uh, thank you to everyone for participating tonight. Uh, we definitely appreciate the pre-recorded message from Comrade Mumia Abu Jamal. Um, we fully intend to continue to fight until he is free, until all political prisoners are free, free them all. This webinar has been organized by Workers World Party, a Marxist-Leninist organization. Okay. Uh, so, uh, as Devin was saying, this webinar has been organized by Workers World Party, a Marxist-Leninist organization fighting for revolution in the belly of the beast. If you are interested in learning more or enjoying, go to workers.org and sign up to join our party. We hope that you will tune in next week, uh, this Thursday, July 2nd at 8 p.m. Eastern Time and 5 p.m. Pacific uh, for our next webinar, which will actually be on Mamiya Elu Jamal and the struggle to free all political prisoners. So be safe. Uh, good night. Thank we you. hope you'll join us. Thank you. Go to work as well.